Hi, it's Richard Dwyer. It's Tuesday, November 27th, 2018. RichardDwyer.com for my crime blog, DwyerCrime.blog, and for some financial news, Keeping It Free. .blogspot.com. Let's talk about the disappearance of Tara Grinstead in 2005, right? Vibrant, 30-something woman suddenly disappears after attending a barbecue. Two men are going to be tried, one for her murder. Right? Let's talk about it. Let's talk about why I doubt the prosecution's theory of the case. But first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now let's be clear here. This video is a little bit different than some of the others I've posted here online. The trial in this case has not yet happened. We don't know the full case the prosecution plans to present. The judge has issued a gag order in the case. So things are shrouded in secrecy. Let me admit openly, this video is one of speculation based on press reports. Now, according to some court documents, at least one of these men confessed to friends years ago about his involvement in the crime. Right? It's unclear whether either defendant is going to cop to making a confession. One of the points of this video, one of the goals is to emphasize that unless the police have very strong corroborating evidence that supports the confession, in other words, unless they can show us the body, unless they have physical evidence to show us the manner of death, Unless they have a coherent narrative that fits the physical evidence that can show us how Tara Grinstead was murdered, then I'm a skeptic on the prosecution's case. The case looks very shaky to me, right? The prosecution, simply put, is going to have to produce surprising previously undisclosed evidence that knocks my socks off for me to even start the journey of considering whether they've proven their case beyond a reasonable doubt. Let me also open this up to the public. Let's make this a public forum. YouTube gives us a great comment section, right? If you have any inside information, if you have any additional facts that you want to share with YouTube Nation, then I hope you do so in the comment section of this video. Let me say, I often get emails from people who have theories of the case, right, for the other videos I've done, or additional facts that they want to share privately with me. I would actually prefer that you share those facts with the public. Because understand, all of these cases have a certain amount of folklore. Some of the information that you think is factual is actually speculation. It's someone's theory. It doesn't actually reflect the facts of the case. Sunlight is the best disinfectant. It's when you bring your beliefs out in public that people can scrutinize them and can separate truth from fiction. So if you have additional information, especially in a case like this, where there's a lot of secrecy, I hope you share that information with all of us 
in the comment section of this video and I encourage everyone watching the video to read the comment section of this video and the others I've posted online. Now let me just say I'm a skeptic of the prosecution's case. According to the warrant in the case, on October the 23rd, 2005, Ryan Duke breaks into Tara Grinstead's home, right? The home is a little bit secluded, right? Neighboring homes aren't close by. Ryan Duke breaks into the home. Later, Grinstead discovers him. Now, the prosecution wants you to believe that Duke then kills her with his bare hands. Right? Presumably by strangulation. But understand, they don't believe he has a knife and he stabs her. They don't believe he has a gun and he shoots her. No, the means to kill her are his hands. He then takes the body outside. He leaves her cell phone in the house, charging right by the wall outlet. Think about it. The cell phone's left charging. He somehow takes her body outside and disposes of it. Now those are the facts put forth in the warrant in very vague and ambiguous terms. I believe the theory has problems, huge problems. Five days after Tara goes missing after the cops have been through her house right friends report her missing the cops go to the house they go through the house police chief Billy Hancock then says that he did not suspect foul play Right? That's the public statement. The police chief. Five days after she goes missing. Openly says that he does not expect foul play. That tells me there is no sign of a break-in. Right? When someone goes missing... If the cops go in the house and guess what? The window's broken. It looks like someone's broken into the house and the occupant is missing. Those are signs of foul play. For the police chief to flatly say that he does not suspect foul play tells me that there's no sign of a break-in. Now, Ryan Duke is in his early 20s at the time. Right? Early 20s. Was he a good enough burglar to leave no trace of his burglary? This is a question the prosecution is going to have to prove to us. If it's going to try to argue that he broke into the house. Was this young guy in his early 20s a skilled professional burglar? In my opinion, the prosecution's really going to have to show you that this guy was practiced. That this guy was rehearsed. That this guy had broken into other homes and had honed his craft. Right? Again, the police chief did not suspect foul play. So when the cops enter the house, everything must have looked pristine. 
right? We're to believe this guy somehow shows up to the house, knows how to get inside, and to not disturb anything. I have a problem with that. Now, let me say, this case was in the news. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation claims it followed hundreds of leads. Right, hundreds. Ten times, at least, the number of fingers on your hands. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation, we'll call them the GBI, Claims it did hundreds of interviews. Claims it executed multiple search warrants. Multiple. Right, let's remember. Tara goes missing in October of 2005. More than a decade ago. During that time, the GBI wants you to believe they were diligent in investigating this crime. But yet the GBI, for years, for years, came up with nothing. Now, how is that plausible? How is the nothingness plausible if their theory of the case is correct? Right? If this young guy, not too far removed from high school, strangled Tara Grinstead to death with his hands in her house. Wouldn't that leave some DNA somewhere? Wouldn't that leave some forensic evidence somewhere? Violent death. Right? This guy breaks in. They encounter each other somehow. The timeline's nebulous. Right? They encounter each other in the house. I'm to believe that this young guy then strangles her to death or beats her to death using his hands. Wow. If someone got beaten to death in this living room in back of me, I'm guessing it would look even sloppier than it looks right now. Right? Maybe this tree would be knocked over. You would see signs of a struggle. Right? How come the cops, after going through her house, didn't see that? Didn't see enough to suspect foul play. Did you know that Tara Grinstead was a singer with a very strong voice? Her voice was a hallmark of hers in beauty pageants. Now I know the other homes aren't close to Tara's home, but understand you're an amateur burglar. If she starts screaming Right? Screaming for her life. Wouldn't a young burglar in his early 20s panic a bit? Even if the neighbors can't hear her, if you're the burglar, do you know that with any certainty? Wouldn't there have been some panic somewhere along the line, given that Tara had a strong voice, according to her sister? Well, let's go further. Did you know that according to Tara's sister, did you know that Tara had some self-defense training? So she's in her house. Let's say the guy gets his hands around her neck. And as far as the public knows, the cops haven't found the body. Folks, we don't even have a cadaver where we could say, yes, there's death by strangulation. But let's say the burglar gets his hands around her neck and is trying to kill her. Wouldn't Tara, with self-defense training, have put up enough of a fight 
to leave evidence of foul play. To have the cops in the house looking around thinking, whoa, there was a fight here. Right? Whoa, things happened in this house. Wouldn't furniture have been knocked over? Wouldn't evidence of a struggle have been obvious to police who looked in the house? Why isn't that so? Let's explore the burglary further. And again, I'm just telling you why I'm a skeptic of any prosecution theory that the burglar gets in the house, doesn't leave a trace, kills her with his own hands, disposes of the body. Well, let's explore this burglary further. Tara's 30 at the time. Young person, image conscious, drove a flashy car. I used to have one of these, a Mitsubishi 3000 GT, right? Flashy car. Hers was white, right? That's the car in the driveway when she goes missing. Now, the burglar who I presume is there looking for valuables, right? Isn't that why you do a burglary? Don't you break into the house looking for stuff you can take and pawn or money you can grab? Well, understand the burglar doesn't take the car. Right? Doesn't take the car. Tara's car keys and purse are missing from the scene. Now, if he encounters her in the house... I'm assuming there'd be the key someplace, right? The burglar doesn't take the car. Now, maybe he panicked. Maybe he didn't want to get caught with their car. Maybe the car was so flashy that he thought, wow, if I drive this white Mitsubishi 3000 GT sports car on the road, everyone's going to know I'm driving Tyrus' car. People are going to sense something's wrong. But understand, there's a wrinkle in this case. On the car console, right, right between the seats, apparently, there was $100 cash. Right? The car is unlocked. All someone has to do is reach in and grab the money. Right? Open the door, reach in, grab the money. Now, I'm not saying most of us passing by a car who look in and see cash in the car are going to do that. But this is a burglar. Isn't that what he's trying to do? The burglar doesn't take the $100. Leaves it there doesn't take it. I find that fishy. Don't you? You're going to go through the trouble of breaking into a house. Right? You're going to go to the trouble of killing the person when they show up at home. Right? You're going to go to the trouble of taking her purse, taking her keys, and then you're not going to take her car, worse yet, you're not going to take the $100 that's right there on the console in the car? This prosecution burglary theory sounds a little bit far-fetched to me. Let's talk about the car a little bit more. The car is found unlocked in the driveway. Right? Unlocked. Now, Tara was five foot three inches tall. But yet the seat in the car had been adjusted 
to fit a taller person. Right? The seats push back. Does the prosecution's theory even have the burglar in the car? Right? The prosecution wants you to believe that the burglar kills her in the house. Why is the seat pushed back? At trial, keep a close eye on how the prosecution explains that. So the burglar is in the car, but the burglar leaves $100 on the console? Worse yet, Tara, according to her sister, I believe the sister's name's Anita Gaddis, Tara loved this car. Right again, image conscious, beauty pageant experience, 30 year old. She loved this white car. Her sister doesn't believe she would drive the car over questionable roads, right? The car is her baby. You don't want to drive the car over roads that are going to fool around with the car's color and fitness. But yet the tires have clay on them. Her sister doesn't believe Tara would drive the car over that surface. Right? The tires have clay on them. White car. Where is the clay from? You know what? The police haven't said. We know Tara was at a barbecue, then she goes home. No one seems to know how this clay got on her tires. Again, it doesn't fit the prosecution's theory of the case that some burglar kills her in the house and has no connection to whatever's going on with her car. Right? Some weird things are going on here. There's stuff on Tara's tires. Clay. And we don't know where it's from. We don't know why Tara would even be driving on a clay road. Let me uh, say this too. Since the car is unlocked, and since the house is locked, think about that. When the cops show up, the house is locked. Let me ask a question here. How do we know that Tara, whose body's not on the property, even makes it into the house? Right? The prosecution has some burglary in the house, murder in the house narrative. Why is the house locked? If Tara was killed in the house, why would the killer then, in taking her body out of the house, decide to lock the house but not the car? Right? Let's just say the scene to me seems consistent with Tara not making it into the house. Also, think about this. Her purse and keys are missing from the scene. You know, when I leave home, one of the things I almost always grab are my keys, right? Because brother wants to get back in when he returns, right? So I'll grab my keys and my wallet. Right? This way I have some cash and I have ID if when I leave home I go somewhere. Right? Isn't the missing purse and keys consistent with Tara herself taking those items? 
right? They show up to our house, a couple things are missing. The very things that most of us take when we leave home. And somehow I'm supposed to believe, no, no, she never left home voluntarily. She got killed in the house and then taken from the home. I'm not, I'm not sure if I believe that. Worse yet, as the killer's taking her from the home, he doubles back and says, you know what? Let me lock the door. Does that sound right to you? How do we know, given that the door's locked to the house, that Tara doesn't pull up in her car, which she leaves in the driveway, and then doesn't jump into another car waiting for her on the street, taking with her her purse and her keys. Maybe she thought she was going to get a drive back home. How do we know there wasn't another driver in that car? Right? Let's continue. Now, her cell phone is found in her house. It's charging in the wall outlet. Now, in this era, someone has to say it, in this era of friends with benefits, of public and private lives, of Ashley Madison websites and the like, in this era where, guess what, some of your neighbors are having affairs. Let's just speculate here. Maybe Tara didn't want to have her cell phone on her. Lord knows I've watched my share of crime shows where they track the person's cell phone. Right? You remember Adnan Saeed and the evidence in Serial? Maybe Tara in 2005 thought, you know, I don't want my cell phone with me. I'm going on a trip where I don't want there to be any evidence that I'm going on the trip. Or I'm going on a trip where I don't plan to be answering my phone. This is a private trip. This is a private moment. A private, perhaps, rendezvous involving someone in another car. Maybe the party even extended to her car. Maybe that's how the seat got pushed back. Now, let me say too, the phone in the charger, charging opens the door to an argument by the defense that Tara's not attacked when she gets home. This isn't a case of burglars in the house and you show up at the house, you close the door and, ah, here's the burglar, you're, oh my God, and you're attacked. No, Tara comes home if you believe she makes it in the house and she has enough time to then walk over to the charger, take out her cell phone, and plug it in. Right? She's not she's not attacked as soon as she gets home. There's some time gap there. If you believe the prosecution's burglar narrative. Right? So let's talk about the reality here. The reality is that we don't know what happened to Tara after she left the barbecue. Right? Last time she's seen. Right? Apart from getting clay on the tires of her white 3000 GT sports car, who knows what happened next? Who knows if she's even the one driving on the clay road? Right? The phone in the seemingly undisturbed house, the house that 
led police to not suspect foul play might have been left there by design. Maybe she didn't want to be tracked or called. Who knows? Maybe she just left the phone at the house before she even went to the barbecue. Keep an eye on her phone records during this trial. Keep an eye on the last call she makes. I'm guessing there's a lot of evidence we just don't know about. Let me say too, the missing person case may have been what she took with her when she hopped into a friend's car in front of her place, leaving her car in the driveway. Right? That's as consistent with any other evidence I've seen. Now, there was a second person who was on trial here, a guy named Bo Dukes. Now, you could imagine if Tara hopped into somebody else's car. Let's say that happened. Let's have an alternative narrative. That's to me as credible as the narrative of Tara getting strangled or beaten to death in her undisturbed house. Let's say Tara instead doesn't make it in the house. Let's say that Tara jumps in a friend's car or Tara makes it into the house, leaves her phone, leaves the house, locks the door, jumps into a friend's car, right? Because she's not going to jump into a stranger's car, is she? So the person in the other car would have to know her. Now, the second defendant in this case, Bo Dukes, happens to have been a family friend. Tara and her sister knew him. Right? Food for thought. Now, because of the judge's gag order, we simply don't know at this stage how he was involved. Keep a close eye on the testimony as it relates to him. Because understand, the other defendant, the burglar, you're hearing in the news that he and Tara attended the same high school. But the timeline doesn't match up. She's older than him. Right? They attended the schools and didn't overlap. There's no evidence that they socialized with each other. Right? Most of his high school career, she's not at the school. Right? Food for thought. They're trying to have a tie-in where they're trying to claim that she came back and taught at a class where he might have been a student. But what I want people to do is to understand if this case is an obsession case, if the burglar wasn't a professional burglar, but was just a young guy who was obsessed with a 30-year-old former beauty queen, obsessed enough to break into her house, then I believe the break-in would have left more evidence. The burglary would have been sloppy. It would have been a first break-in by someone obsessed with the occupant of the house. Not an undetected break-in by a burglar who had done it before, who had already gone through the learning curve of how to break in a house without leaving any signs of foul play, as appears to have been the case here. Finally, let's talk about the evidence the police are relying on. Now, this case was all over the news, as you can imagine. Tara Grinstead had friends. Former beauty queen, right? Goes missing. Friends, co-workers, they call the police within days saying, hey, we haven't seen Tara. Right? They're people who loved and cared about Tara. 
This case is in the news for years. The GBI is claiming to have interviewed hundreds of people. But yet, the break in the case comes from a tip that the police don't receive the first year, the second year, the third year. When does the case become a cold case? The fourth year, the fifth year, the sixth year. The tip comes more than a decade later. Think about it. There's a tip that the police receive more than a decade later. Now, we don't know much about this tip. During the trial, you need to focus on it because the prosecution's case is only as good as the credibility of the tipster. Right? Let's just be blunt here. The evidence in the case is stale. It's a cold case when the police get a tip. So we know the police then, in following up on the tip, the stale tip, the tip that the tipster didn't make when the case was on the front page of the paper. Right? We know that after getting this tip, the police then went looking for her body. I'm just telling you, if the cops did not find the body, if the tip did not pan out on that key issue, then I just don't see how the prosecution proves their case. Unless they have DNA evidence. Right? Unless they have some evidence that can place the burglar at the scene of the alleged burglary. I don't even know how they do that. Right? So the tip to me is stale. It's several years too late. If it's also unreliable, in other words, if the tip said, hey, her body's going to be found on this farm, then the cops go to the farm, search the farm, and don't find the body. That's going to be an awfully bad sign for the prosecution, isn't it? Let me also say this, too. You know, I was a young man once, as hard as that is to believe. And my goodness, did my friends and me talk a lot of smack. Talk about a lot of things that, looking back, we probably didn't do. Right? Every guy wants you to believe that they're a playboy. Every young guy wants you to believe that they're a risk taker. Now, in some court papers, they're saying that one, if not both, of these defendants admitted some culpability with the disappearance right, of this former beauty queen, gorgeous, young, single woman, right? I'm just telling you that you should view young guy confessions where they're talking about crimes to their friends and the crime involves some glamorous looking, gorgeous, young, available woman, right? I'm just telling you, you should view any such confession, we'll put it in quotes, with suspicion, right? Young guys talk about a lot of things they haven't done. This isn't the first case I've heard of where some young guy wants to take credit for participation in some daring crime, right? Young guys are self-delusional. That's what being young is all about. Right? Young guys want you to believe that they've been with gorgeous women. Young guys think it's prestigious to claim that they were involved in dangerous activity. Right? The burden is on the prosecution to show us why any confession or bragging by any early 20s young guy to friends 
should be believed. Right? This is different qualitatively than a confession to the police. Where you're read your rights and there's a protocol. Right? Let's hope the prosecution doesn't get up in front of a jury and say, hey, these young guys were bragging years ago about uh, having been involved with this young, attractive woman. Let's hope. Let's hope. There's more to the prosecution's case than that. Here's what we know, though, with certainty. Within days of her disappearance, within days, trained law enforcement people were in her house and did not see signs of foul play. Right? We know that. The cell phone is charging. The house was locked when they got there. Her car's in the driveway. There's $100 cash on the console. Right? I'm not sure how from those facts, especially if you don't have a body. Maybe they do. Maybe they do. But if you don't have a body, I don't know how, from those facts, you reach the conclusion that she was strangled or beaten to death in her house. I don't know how you come up with a scenario where she's ambushed in the house, when the car looks like the seat's been moved, when the car has clay on the tires and no one knows where the car has been. So I'm a skeptic right now. The burdens on the state to prove the guilt of the defendants in this case beyond a reasonable doubt. We'll see if they pull it off. Let me know what you think. If there are relevant facts that I've left out that you feel the people here on YouTube need to know about, please leave that information in the comment section to this video. Let's start the discussion. Thanks for stopping by.